Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Today is November 3rd. And we're doing business and security. Wait, not business. Business. Was it business? Did I say business last time? Last episode, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't think mm. so. My brain might have autocorrected that. I don't remember. Oh, we'll learn more about that later. Yeah, someone I'm sure will comment. <clears throat> well, the big business news this week, and to, certainly in the technology world, everybody was waiting to see... Can Apple do it again? They blew everybody's mind with the M1, but can they follow up on that? Apple's M1 Pro and M1 Max, a system on chip investigated new performance and efficiency heights. This is from Anantech. They did a really good job writing this up and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're nice. They do a lot. The strangest thing with it is that the performance of a single M1 core hasn't really moved. So these laptops just have 10 of them, and also a crap load of GPU cores. So as where the first M1 system on chip was kind of anemic. 10 cores plus up to 32 GPU cores plus dual HBM memory. Yeah, it's really insane now. Definitely seems like these will be a competitor in the desktop market. But in the laptop market, are they still number one? Who has the fastest CPU for gaming? And I realize I've sorted incorrectly. <laughs> 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 Oh, oops. Uh, CPU benchmarks pre-release Intel Alder Lake chips beat Intel's Apple M1 Max. At the time we're filming this, we can't say what the actual results are, but there's this, and this is a leak, and this leak says it beats the Apple's M1 Max. Now, in the back of your mind, you should be worried about the whole power envelope delta, because a single core on the M1 doesn't use a lot of power, but a single core on the Intel side, oh boy, oh boy, it's a lot of power. Well, that's fine. I don't think that uh, energy costs are set to go up, are they? <laughs> it certainly doesn't matter if you have a 95-watt <laughs> laptop. It's fine. Oh, uh, And uh, Apple, it seems, in the face of the ongoing antitrust push and their recent court wins slash losses, they are making some concessions. Apple got updates its App Store guidelines to permit developers to contact customers about other payment methods. Weirdly, though, they can't require an email address or other contact information. They just can request it. I like that. This is a bit of a waffle over because the Epic thing, because they were like, we're going to comply with the settlement and then we're going to change it and then they weren't. And it seems like Apple is kind of swinging on both sides of what they have to do while the appeal is pending in the Epic case. An app never needs my email address. Well, how are they going to get money directly from you? How can they not send you notifications incessantly in your email inbox? Amazon Pay. Okay. Yeah. I'll just give all my money to Bezos. I'm comfortable <laughs> with that at this point. <laughs> and when it comes to all the money, Bezos does have a lot of it, but he keeps leapfrogging with Mr. Musk over who has the most. And this one is bad news for him. Tesla surpasses a $1 trillion market valuation. Mostly that was uh, Hertz. Hertz in their 100,000 car order, but hey, you know, whatever. That is going to be dangerous because we're about to see full self-driving in the hands of more morons <laughs> all over the country. <laughs> it's full self-driving. I thought you were going to say that's dangerous for him because, like, the guillotines come out at $1 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> It's a game event once you hit that. I don't think so. I think he, he's good at the PR. People like him. Uh, I don't know why, but they do. I don't know. I feel like... Public opinion is maybe changing a little bit, but we'll see. Yeah, but the next time we put something in space, yeah, everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, space. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, you know what I meant to do originally, because the sort was going to be like, oh, uh, you know, Google, antitrust, app store guidelines. Maybe it's because of this, and I just screwed myself again. <laughs> it was a bad sort today. Exclusive. Google warns customers about antitrust bills. So... There's a lot of people looking into Google right now and Google-owned companies, Alphabet-owned companies. And um, Google's trying to get in front of that a little bit, in front of their customers to say, hey, look, this is misleading. We need this in order to do this thing. Like, what they're saying is that we make a lot of money on this, and that's not really true. I mean, we do, but... Well, more importantly, it's more of a threat. They're saying, hey, you like all of your... Analytics, right? You like all your Google products. Makes your business run really smooth, right? What if something were to happen to those? <laughs> Be a shame for your ad revenue to go to zero. 
What if you couldn't track your customers anymore? What if your email wasn't even working? What's going to happen then? And the other argument they make is all this stuff we're being accused of, we don't really do stuff like that. We don't use our position to manipulate other companies and force them to do things they don't want to do. That's just not something <laughs> that Google does. What an amazing <laughs> transition. A leaked email allegedly shows that Google did actually ask Roku for special search treatment for YouTube. There's we, always an email, isn't there? You got to read this comment. Again, you know, it's like it goes back to what we were saying on Monday. It's like we obsessively document things which is great for when things are illegal are happening. Now, this is the statement that was made before this email was leaked. Yeah, we, when we covered this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Google said, to be clear, we have never, as they have alleged, made any requests to access user data or interfere with search results. This claim is baseless and false. Was that email a lie? <laughs> Survey says... <laughs> 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 yes, in fact, uh, there was an email where they said that uh, they would like to have some preferential treatment. And as Roku pointed out, we covered that last week, Roku was like, they didn't want more money. We might have played ball with more money. They wanted to control our search results and insisted that certain things appear on our dashboards in certain places. They were all YouTube products. So, it sounds like a lie to me. That'll come out of the antitrust. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a tough email. <laughs> that email's going to cost them a lot of money. <laughs> and speaking of companies who lie, remember <laughs> AT&T's lies about 5G <laughs> are too many. We can't enumerate all of them. The biggest ones were, this is 5G when it was just more 4G. Yeah. And then the other one was, this new 5G is as good as everybody else's 5G when it was missing very important aspects. AT&T 5G Plus expansion plan highlights how much its mid-band coverage trails T-Mobile. So remember the congressional hearings, like the acquisition thing, when the CEO of T-Mobile said, at and is lying to Congress because they know that you need 5G at the mid-band to cover all of the use cases in America. We've got the high end and the low end. That's for density and range. We need something in the middle for basically all of America because all of America is not rural Nebraska and not New York. And that's pretty... Pretty plain language, pretty easy for CEO to understand. And AT&T was like, we don't need mid-band 5G. Well, here it is, right there. So they're going to add mid-band 5G for your 5G Plus subscription. 5G Plus is not 5G. The 5G subscription still won't have it. <laughs> what a hideously evil company. <laughs> I mean, just so wretched. And as we saw last episode, the big banks and the government regulators are we're, they're ready to take the step into cryptocurrency because they need to control it. <laughs> Bloomberg reports that MasterCard is going to allow banks to offer crypto credit and debit cards. Remember when MasterCard and banks like Chase were just turning people off? Yo, we see that you transferred $2,000 to Coinbase. Uh, here's a check for your balance. Uh, you no longer bank with us. That was the thing that Chase did. Chase literally did that. Chase is garbage. And now they're like, okay, yeah, let's do this. And MasterCard's like, yeah, this crypto thing, woo, we're on board. It's almost like the market forced their hand. <laughs> or they're in control of it now and satisfied with it. Remember Clubhouse? Oh, yeah. No one does. No. I don't think that it ever turned into anything cool. Elon Musk made it cool for 10 minutes, but that was just cult of personality. It wasn't really well, a great product. It was just frat, bo, frat yeah. bro stuff. And so Amazon is taking a look at it and they say, you know what? We could leverage some of the other stuff that we have as part of your prime subscription here. We can make that a lot cooler. Amazon is building a clubhouse competitor that turns hosts into DJs. Amazon's got the licenses for the music. People like having a curated music list. What about a music channel where you tune in and there's 3,000 people listening to a person organize and curate the list and you know, blend the tracks together. That would be okay under copyright law. People actually want that. I think this is a good idea. I do too. And I would love to do this. I've definitely got some like DJ fantasies. I would love to show you my eclectic taste in music even more so. I would love for Wendell to have to do it. <laughs> oh. But the rule is no Weird Al. You got to do an oh. hour of musical programming, no Weird Al. Well, thank God for Dr. Demento and no uh, parody <laughs> oh just like just music for music's sake right i only made it through craft work that's all i've got 
<laughs> if you had to pick a genre that's not parody, what what genre do you enjoy? Electronic digital. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> It's good dance music. No about uh, also, that. like the score from Revenge of the Nerds, where like they're doing the talent competition, like whatever that was, whatever genre that is. I like is. movie scores. That's a valid but choice. But it, it's always his emotional attachment to music has to be through another avenue. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. what's hilarious about it. Like, there's a reason he likes that, not because of the music. Yeah, it's just an association. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing that inside that brain, <laughs> something got turned off and a bunch of other stuff got turned on. If you could do that. Would you do it for a kid? <laughs> for your child? Having lived with it? Probably not. Do you think the music is worth something? I mean, well, just the other things the that other come stuff. along. <laughs> that. Aesthetic appreciation has a place. Telling left from right? Yeah. There's... Now, see, I have that struggle, too. And me and Wendell are like on opposite ends of the spectrum because he's like hard science and I'm hard art. <laughs> Neither of us are good at it. Both of you are walking into walls. Yeah. Well, I just got... A new ISP. Oh, I'm so happy about it. I'm so happy. It's, it, it increases my happiness to such a degree. It's amazing. And this company wants to bring that to the rest of the country, I guess. This startup wants to disrupt big internet providers. Basically, it's a private company that's taking the municipal broadband idea, but they are doing it privately. So what they would do is do the last mile fiber service and then rent it out to companies. Now, the way that, the reason this hasn't worked previously is because if you have AT&T and Spectrum together, they will collude not to bid on your last mile fiber to put you out of business, and then they will buy it and then not use it. That is literally the design pattern for this kind of business all over the country. So this company is going to offer a very low tier service on the fiber and allow other companies to offer better services. But they still, they already have like really nice service, right? I think it's 50 bucks for 500 megabit. Yep. And 70 or 65 for gigabit. Yeah. Spectrum and AT&T can't touch that. By offering other companies access to their network, they're able to clear some regulatory hurdles that they otherwise wouldn't be able to clear. So they may actually be onto something with this. Now, how angry are Spectrum customers going to be when they offer Spectrum through the fiber in that location? See, I, nowhere else. See, I think that uh, Spectrum certainly has tried to preempt this kind of thing by mandating franchise agreements. So if you have a small town, they would say, this company is competing with us. That is against the franchise agreement. We only, we are allowed to sell service. But this company is selling service to customers that are underserved in that area. So it's kind of a gray area. That's when you contact your city council, whoever makes that decision, yeah. and you let them know about the social media campaign to support the other guy yeah if they do that yeah, literally the the city councilor all just they're creating a situation so that the city management hopefully looks at this and it's like i don't understand why you're against this company giving you access to their network i mean you're telling us that it takes millions of dollars a year for you to maintain your infrastructure and this company somehow is doing it for way less than that and they're going to give you access to their network for less than it costs you to maintain your own network. How is that a bad thing again? And they say, oh, did you know we were a monopoly? Do you know how much money we make being a monopoly? That would threaten that. I am, it's getting to the point where I know how cliche it is. I, when, I, when it comes out of my mouth, this is like, you know, when the, the media conditions you to the point where they tell the lie so many times, and when somebody parrots the lie to you, and you're like, no, that's not true. And they're like, that's just a talking point. I was like, no, it's, I've looked into it. I'm fairly confident. I have that same feeling now when I make comparisons to 1984. Yeah. But this is the memory hole. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. Not necessarily state-run, I guess, but in a way, yeah. the state certainly has a hand in this. Gizmodo's photos from the massive iPhone 4 leak have disappeared. Why have they disappeared? Well, their parent company is taking down a lot of old media because they keep getting false copyright claims. And, well, frankly, it's just exhausting having all of those old images up. So they point out several other things. There was uh, articles that, like this anti-union article <laughs> had some shots. Hmm, that's gone. An anti-Amazon article from Gizmodo? Huh. Oh. And uh, this was some stuff about Nintendo? Have they ever done anything aggressive with copyrights? Nintendo, what are you doing? They pointed out that this was an image that was created specifically for the story, but because of the content, it's a 
it's a SNES game and an ice cube. It's actually pretty good. Can't show it anymore. Just gone. So they point out that, like, what's going to be left of the internet if this continues and gets worse? Uh, certainly a lot of YouTubers, you know, you use, like, the uh, music providers, and uh. then five years later, the music providers are like, hey, we're going to claim copyright on, on that. You use their music. And it's like, no, at the time but that it, I it used fine, it. it was fine, yeah. Yeah, it was a free, perpetual, worldwide, irre- irrevocable license. And well, that's the way uh, a lot of things work now, too. There's, like, Music Bed, I think, is one where it's, like, free YouTube music, license it through us through a monthly subscription. I'm like, what happens when that monthly subscription ends? Does that mean my whole back catalog? Yeah. 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 That's probably, that's almost like a a payday loan top deal where Mm -hmm. they get you both ways. Every view is a new performance under copyright law. So what was the name of the the dark web service that put research papers up there? Do you remember the name of that? Yeah, I, uh, I thought about that when I was reading this. I was like, that's amazing. Was it Elsevier? Something like that. But anyway, it got shut down because they were technically violating copyright. By doing what they were doing was illegal in some places, in a lot of places. Almost all the researchers were like, no, you're doing God's work. This is amazing. But the, you know, that's just not how it works. So, the actual industry behind the scientists <laughs> and researchers was like, no. They found hosting and they had a lot of support and there were definitely an infrastructure to help them. But then... Country by country, you'd get stuff like DNS blocks yeah. and takedowns and stuff Their like that. Their name got seized. Lawsuits. So what do you do? Well, this guy, this brilliant man, <laughs> figured out to the letter of the law how to get around it. What is your time frame on how long before they go The lawsuit him? has already been filed. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. Giant free index to the world's research papers has been released online. A catalog of billions of phrases from 107 million papers could ease computerized searching of the literature. So all this stuff is hidden behind a paywall. He can't really get at it. Blah, blah, blah. He has indexed all of those. And he's indexed it in such a way that you can't reconstruct the original research papers. So I think that, and I think that what he's counting on legal theory wise is basically like a telephone directory. And I think this probably will hold up under U.S. law. That, that won't stop them. I mean, remember Bleem, the, the PlayStation emulator? That was also legal. But Sony still just sued them into oblivion and appealed and sued them into oblivion and just you know, bankrupted the developers for doing something that was actually legal. That's going to happen with this guy. So the reason it's just phrases is because, you know, obviously copyright and plagiarism, five words, or is it six words? It's like five or six. Five or six words you can get away with. You can reproduce that, and it's not a big deal because it's just a fragment. So he has used that to create a searchable index so that you can now search these works at least, and it'll tell you, if your thing appears there, and then it'll tell you how to get to the real paper. You couldn't even search them before that because indexing them would have violated something. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And it's like a telephone directory and under the law. Like, that's what the defense attorney needs to focus on. It's like, this is just a t- telephone directory for the 21st century. That's for all, now. That's all it is. For now. <laughs> <laughs> that law's going to change. Yeah. yeah. Rapidly. It'll make your head spin how quick that law changes. And, oh man, this should have been in the hardware section. But uh, one thing we know about meta, we don't know what the metaverse is. We don't know what we're going to do in the metaverse. We don't know how the Facebook rules are going to apply to the metaverse. But we know that they have at least designed one piece of hardware. Facebook's Meta Watch has a camera notch, according to the first leaked image. That's a privacy concern. (laughs) Yeah, I don't don't love that. (laughs) I can't wait for the press photos to show a bunch of people... You know that are that are very uh, fit and very young and attractive, and they're all having fun. And one of them has got his watch, and he's like, "Everybody smile!" Or take ah. a selfie. Also, people would get really good at like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think my camera will be any good? It's a pretty small form factor. I don't know. They've gotten scary in, in phones. I never would yeah. have thought that a phone can have a reasonable 4K 60 capture, but they totally can. We're gonna see so many videos. From the perspective of the cuffs, <laughs> and like the cop going in his pocket for the crack. Ooh. Oh man, there have been two or three new videos this week where the the cops accidentally recorded themselves figuring out how they're going to frame the guy that was annoying him. Yeah, <laughs> there's going to be a lot more of those. The people that film the cops get that constantly, and they always forget to turn the camera off when they seize it. Do you think they should have like a, a, a some sort of uh, professional development retreat that they go to that to teach them how to do all that? How stuff. to tell if the phone is streaming to Twitch live? Yeah. 
Or maybe get some of those little pouches, those little Faraday pouches. Oh, yeah. Like at the concerts. Yeah. They used to hand those out like candy at those uh, law enforcement events. I think you got to hand them back in, though, don't you? No, no. They let it, they, well, I mean, I don't know. I thought you could keep them. Oh, as like an advertising. Yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, let's try and think about, uh, I don't remember the exact s- series of events, so you'll have to help me, but the saga of Oculus. <laughs> so Oculus created the most popular VR platform. And then Facebook while, bought it. They were the number one by far. And it was popular enough that Facebook stepped in and bought it. Then Facebook, faced with backlash, said, listen, this is Oculus. This is not Facebook. You'll never need an account to right. log into your Oculus. We're not going to kill this off or do anything bad to it. This is just, we bought it. We're going we're gonna to leave these people in charge, even. And then eventually, the Oculus CEO left. And they forced a re- Facebook registration. And then... They announced that going forward, like, maybe, I don't even know if we'll call the new one Oculus. Maybe we'll just call it Facebook. I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? But the Oculus brand is still strong. The company, formerly known as Facebook, unceremoniously kills off the Oculus brand. Uh, to, his, cre- to his credit, John Carmack did actually release uh, the unlocker for the Oculus Go. They've just outright abandoned the Oculus Go. So if it would you have want, been a paperweight. Yeah, if you wanna, if you want to hack on that... You have literally John Carmack, the the nerd behind the Doom engine and Quake and Wolfenstein, um, to thank for the fact that your Oculus Go is not a brick currently. When did this happen? Because I, I was just on their website the other day and like Oculus was still listed under Facebook products. Well, that's hilarious when it happened. So Zuckerberg did, did the big meta speech right? yeah they did the presentation and one of the things he said in the presentation i remember the quote but it was he was saying like no we're not changing everything we're not doing all these things that you know like we're not destroying any of the facebook stuff it's all going to be left alone the next day they didn't mention anything about this at that event the next day that guy posted a blog post hidden away somewhere and people found it and they're like wait a minute this means you're killing oculus <laughs> it's still on there well at the time of recording i think it's still on their website as a product they offer but Probably not for long. No, the next version will not be called that. I mean, you got to call that thing that, right? Because you printed it on the box. Yeah. Did you mean to skip that story? But then, oh, did I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good catch. I got caught up in the banter. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, this one is, you know, I mean, come on. Everybody knew this was going to happen. <laughs> we literally warned you this would happen I, this, before the lockdown. There was no chance that this could not happen. <laughs> a security bug in a health app. And health app Docket, did you use Docket for the thing? Exposed uh, records about whether or not you got the jab. The the bug, now fixed, allowed access to other people's uh, vax records. Seems kind of catastrophic. Yeah, and the old, uh, this gets everybody who does this kind of thing, the linear iterating user ID. You don't want the linear, linear iterating user ID, and if you do have that, you sure as hell don't want an endpoint that takes that as an argument that doesn't authenticate. Oh, my Lord. Because that's what they had. Once you saw your URL, just increase by one. You'll see somebody else's card. Increase it again. Build a scraper. This is worse than the social security number thing that they're still doubling and tripling down on. Well, it'd be hard to steal somebody's identity with that information. Mm. But it would be easy to target them yeah. if they don't have an entry. Mm. Yeah. And Iran has had some issues. Iran is an interesting place because they have a lot of oil. <laughs> a lot of oil. And that's a state run industry. And if you live there, you get a special kind of card that if you visit Iran, gas ain't that cheap. But if you have your citizen card, gas is real cheap. I mean, you know, just it's ridiculously cheap. But. That means that there is a centralized system that has to be operable. A cyber attack paralyzed every gas station in Iran. And this details how that happened. Yay, state-run industry. They don't know who did it, but they've got a a guess. (laughs) Oh, Lord. We might have been involved in that. One of our friends over there in that area, we might have assisted a bit. (laughs) DeFi is the big... uh, catchphrase now you want to decentralize your cryptocurrency but it seems like every time you do that you run into this DeFi protocol cream finance loses another 130 million in latest crypto hack 
Uh, At least one a week these days. Yeah, I thought the sucks su- to suck. I thought the subheading was crypto berries, and now it's like, ooh, I need to trademark that if that's not already trademarked. Crypto berries. Mm, I don't like know what that is yet. Crypto berries and cream. <laughs> a, a new <laughs> NFT type of deal. Yeah, I don't. What if we did a Tamagotchi style thing, where the NFT you had to it was a plant and you had to nurture it, <laughs> and then you could trade it later. The level of neglect the plant endures vastly affects its genetic profile. And the eventual price on the marketplace. <laughs> November. <laughs> and uh, once in a while, someone will figure out a way to steal bitcoins that's brilliant. But it's almost like when they're doing it, they're like, ah, this will never work. And they don't take any security precautions. And then when it does work amazingly well, there's a trail of breadcrumbs that's going to get you every single time. Teen bought Google Ad for his scam website and made 48 Bitcoin at duping UK online shoppers. <laughs> and the judge said if he was an adult, he would be going inside. But 48 it's Bitcoins during that time was not what it is now. It was much less, way less. So I don't think he got that kind of money. But if he had kept it till today and didn't have to give everything back, 2.1 million pounds. Seems like he could just you know write the people that he scammed you know, a million pounds, like split a million pounds between them and keep it and still be better off. Well, I think the state will do that. <laughs> so his his game was he got a, a Google ad that pointed to a certain website, or at least it said it did, and then he made a perfect copy of that website. Now, that, you know what? That would be a Dev Ember project. Yeah. We would have to denounce it. But secretly, <laughs> I'd be like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> I'm not even angry. Should we hire him? <laughs> And we got our weekly ransomware. This time it wasn't a huge uh, target. This one may be more ideological than commercial, but they did it. (laughs) The operators of the Grief Ransomware have uh, today listed the U.S. National Rifle Association as one of their victims. (laughs) Look at that website. It looks like uh, Angel Fire. Oh, wow. Tripod. (laughs) Brings back some memories. The NRA is not what it once was. And a bit of a win, although there's so many caveats <laughs> it's here. A, it's a Pyrrhic victory. Yeah, but hey, you take what you can, right? Proton Mail celebrates a Swiss court victory exempting it from telco data retention laws. Remember those French protesters that uh, were apartment sitting? They were squatting in an apartment. I was say which ones because they're always <laughs> protesting. <laughs> it was a state building, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was. But they were squatting, and they were, you know, the state police in France labeled them as terrorists. And contacted the Swiss police and said, "Hey, Proton Mail, we need info." Proton Mail didn't have any info because they don't log it. But Proton Mail was required under Swiss law to change their program to log the mobile push IDs. We get a little bit more details in that about that case of the people that were using Proton Mail. Well, with the push IDs, that uniquely identifies a mobile device and makes it a lot easier to search the network for those devices. That's how they found those people. Well, Proton Mail finally got the court to say hey uh we can't compel proton mail to modify their service to retain records they otherwise do not retain you can do that with a communications provider but proton mail just barely doesn't classify as a communications provider under swiss law but they did previously put them in that basket with the isps to get what they wanted yeah Mm -hmm. and i think this is a very skin of the teeth and I think it'll be pretty easy to convince some lawmaker that they need to close that loophole so I don't know that we've really had any significant victory here but how this was used in this specific case is offensive and that's a public service announcement I mean we're going toward a time where you might find yourself in need of protesting something you know I mean and I know I'm not talking about political ideology I'm talking about when bread is $50 <laughs> you might want to you know say some things never take your phone I realize how inconvenient that is but trust me Never take your phone. They had a case of Orange Crush. It was eleven dollars <gasps> for that's a illegal 12? <laughs> for twelve cans. What retailer no, was oh. what retailer was doing that? That was uh, I don't know. I think that was that, I got that information secondhand, but I got a picture, and it was like there's no way that's right. Was, was that like right. a convenience store or something? Yeah. Wow. Somebody knows what they got. It's bad. It's really Twenty four cans. What's that? What was that in the before times? Like four dollars. Yeah, I was gonna say that sounds right. Like four or five bucks. Wow. Yeah. 50 cents a can is basically what you're paying there. That's yeah. that's gas station, like, chilled individual serving prices. <laughs> yeah. In the big gulp. 
Like, it's not even 12 <laughs> ounces. It's like, you know, the fountain grade stuff. I don't know. Well, Windows 11 is out there, and a lot of people are saying, I'm not interested in that for a variety of reasons, and they're hanging on to Windows 10. And Microsoft is like, well, hang on, wait. We wanted you to upgrade. You will upgrade, or we will force you. Microsoft is force installing PC Health Check in Windows 10. So this is the thing that's going to come up and nag you if your computer's not good enough for Windows 11. It's like, do we need a program to tell me that? Yes. <laughs> just turn off the TPM on your motherboard. <laughs> Mine's <laughs> off by default. I'm just like, hey, I'm fine with this. Because <laughs> Microsoft will not bother you if you do that. The Darknet continues to be probably the globe's biggest drug dealer, ultimately. Maybe not at wholesale prices, but to the, the last mile of drug dealing <laughs> is big on the dark web. And they're constantly setting up these things. I feel like 150 is a tragically low number for yeah. what they invested in this, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Probably. 150 people arrested in an international darknet opioid probe. So this is this sounds like a distribution network, but when you dig into it, it seems like it was just like, you know, the local last mile. And I think that's what happens in the dark web. Like, like the big shipments of the precursors for fentanyl and stuff like that. I don't think that happened on the dark web. Maybe it does. A really obscure corner of it, maybe. But you definitely wouldn't open that up to user registration. <laughs> yeah. It's like a like a box service, like Blue Apron, but it's for drugs. I mean, that's basically what they have on the dark web. What right. do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a mule. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and when it comes to bad malware, we learn more and more that the checks and balances might be there, <laughs> but no one's really paying attention. It's like they're you know they're putting stuff through the X-ray machine, but when it beeps, no one does anything. <laughs> Hackers somehow got their rootkit a Microsoft issued digital signature. Five Sys rootkit somehow got a valid digital signature to help bypass cybersecurity measures in order to steal usernames and passwords from victims. This is this was surprising to the article author. But remember the Sony root kit? Sony literally wrote a root kit to try to stop you from burning CDs. And Microsoft was like, eh, it's and, fine. And that guy who was blowing the whistle on all the, the Microsoft hosted <laughs> SharePoint and Exchange yeah. stuff? Yeah, it's like, put your malware on OneDrive. Microsoft will never take it down. And they pointed out, I don't know what happened with that, but I didn't see any follow-ups where like, Microsoft was like, oh, God, we got to fix this. <laughs> And we have a data breach. Again, we need to have at least one a week, right? And this one is interesting because literally three years ago, this company's biggest competitors, might even be some sort of like umbrella owned same company, had this exact thing, same thing happen to them. And they didn't look in the mirror at all and be like, <laughs> hmm, maybe, maybe we should we look should, into that. Yeah, should we change anything? No, 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 it'll be fine. Zales.com leaked customer data, just like sister firms Jared and K Jewelers did in 2018. So if you're interested in diamonds online, which actually this is really fun because we could mess with the algorithm. If we mention diamonds a whole bunch near the beginning of the episode or in the title, you're going to get a lot of ads for diamonds. Probably going to get a lot of ads for diamonds just from having read that. Jewelry, diamonds. What are the keywords? We're gonna, Gold. We're going to remember uh, to title it. Engagement ring. Uh, <laughs> Engagement ring challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Engagement challenge. <laughs> we're gonna forget that title by the next well by the time we go to title this next week we'll it forget happens that. every time i think last week you had a really good one for one of the episodes we totally spaced out it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter yeah. literally does not matter we could we could title it uh you yeah. know reheated poop and people would be like all right sounds good youtube YouTube's, doesn't seem to care anymore yeah youtube's gonna show it to the same twenty five thousand people no matter what we do. They, they do still really heavily weight the first 10 minutes of closed captioning Mm. Do you think that's a, a time-saving measure? Yeah. yeah. How do we how do we boost that first ten minutes? We talk about Joe Biden for the first ten minutes. Uh, no, probably Logan Paul, and then the <laughs> yeah, whatever's is, trending on YouTube, I guess. And then we the have algorithm to check is that. like transgender. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's on the naughty list. No, we but can't. if we're pro transgender, no, we'll that's get a, in the feature. No, see, they say that they're pro that, but they're actually anti that when you look at what they do with the keywords. Yeah, you gotta you gotta check the trending list. It's usually like Minecraft stuff or like some new pop song that came out. We have to talk about that for ten minutes. Are you suggesting that the entire transgender movement has been co opted by corporations and is now basically meaningless and just a way to crush dissent? Not only has it like no, no. I mean, I may be suggesting that. I don't know. I can neither confirm it or not. No. But are you, would you say you're fluid on it? <laughs> I would definitely. 
<laughs> but not only that, that uh, when those kinds of things pop up, they know immediately exactly what to do with you. And Ah, uh, yes, they can crush it no matter where you stand on right. it. Right, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I would agree with that observation for sure. So they, they've, they've moved the conversation about those things from being relevant and meaningful to just... You know, it's like let's just advertisers put don't like that, so we're gonna put it over here. We're just gonna put all of those people in this this room, and we're just gonna close the door and <laughs> forget that they're there. That seems like the opposite of what they're advertising. <laughs> no, doesn't it? <laughs> it's somehow worse than being pro or anti if you just. Right. It's always yeah. just been about the advertising. <laughs> you can't be on the sidelines anymore. It's lonely over here. I'll tell you. Well, license plate readers, we know how ubiquitous they are. We know that they are on every police vehicle. We know they're on taxis. We know they're on the side of the road, mounted to poles at various locations. But what about private license plate readers (laughs) in the hands of private entities? How terrifying is that? License plate scanners uh, were supposed to bring peace of mind. Instead, they tore the neighborhood apart. Because they were uh, tracking where everybody went, and neighbors started shooting each other. And, uh, oh boy. They being a homeowners association. Ugh. So the homeowners association, they said, hey, we're, we have crime in the neighborhood. We need to do something about it. They interviewed some people and they were like, there was no crime. We were fine. There was no crime. There was just an overzealous HOA person. I don't know how true that Someone's is. Someone's grass was an inch above what it was supposed to be. Exactly. So they put the uh, license plate reader in a, like the entrance to the subdivision. So anytime you came in and out, you got logged, right? And they gave every member of the HOA the login, which means that everybody in the subdivision could suddenly spy on everybody else. And it devolved into something terrible pretty quickly. Yay! That's why one of my conditions when I bought a house was no HOAs. (laughs) Also, that license plate server is like five grand a month for the full software package. Pretty sure we could have wrote that in FFmpeg in a weekend. How much? No, it's not even video. It's just a dashboard to show you the, the plate numbers. Yeah. We could have built that. And <laughs> what are the dues HTML for that neighborhood if know. they're able to afford that? Because usually, like, HOAs also have, like, a pool and, like, other amenities. So they're paying for the amenities plus that 5000 a month. Yeah, probably one up. Yeah. Stupid. <laughs> Remember the Sinclair ransomware attack? We talked about how that shut them down, and it proved that everything is run from one command and control location. (laughs) Your local feeds are not controlled anywhere in your state, actually. There's just one building that does it all, and because of that, the ransomware was particularly effective. Sinclair workers say that the TV channels are in pandemonium after a ransomware attack. Why? Well, because Sinclair has specifically only hired people that follow orders. They don't really want anyone that can think for themselves, as a result, all of the local TV channels are in chaos because literally no one there knows how to run things, which is by design. Did you say Sinclair or FBI? <laughs> I, had, I didn't notice this. I, my mom, I don't have cable. I asked my mom about it, and I don't think she noticed anything either. I don't know. A lot of the TV hosts now, and some, well, I don't know, the channels around here, because I have to, I get to see some of this because mom. Yeah. And um, the channels around here, like the hosts are like, trying to you know joke and have banter and stuff but it's worse than like it's us. worse than it's worse than us yeah i was thinking that i didn't want to complete the sentence but it's it's worse than like you know even like some of the really terrible youtube channels where you know somebody just decided today that they were going to be a youtuber and they're filming it on their phone it's worse than that well what value do they offer at this point they were an empty vessel. There, there was. It's mostly them. just old people who watch yeah. the news. Like I go to, I go to the local news station, like their website, if I want to <laughs> see news. Yeah, but the news anchors like have their laptop on the desk now, and they're just reading the news from like Reuters.com. They're like, "Oh my God, the world is so dark," and it's like, mm-hmm. well, that hits a little close to home, doesn't it? Uh. But yeah, it's disgusting. And Sinclair is uh, decidedly a political bias. They're very right wing. I don't know if we have a local Sinclair station, Krista. That might be why Do we you not? Maybe that's it. why my mom didn't notice anything, because I asked her about it. Uh, uh. And our final story is another story just like that one where, you know, if you've ever watched any of these or you pay attention to the news, you're going to be like, yeah, well, of course, obviously, I already knew this. But now the normies are starting to find out, and we're starting to figure out exactly how bad it is. 
Internet service providers collect and sell a horrifying amount of sensitive data, a government study concludes. Remember that? Remember when the ISPs were like, no, we, we need to control your DNS. You can't have encrypted DNS everywhere. That's crazy. Exhibit A. So they did not name any names. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, come on. But they pointed out, what was it, like uh, seven or eight major ISPs, which is all of them. Yeah. And they were all offenders. There were some that were worse than others, but even the ones who claim they didn't do this were using some like third party yes. nonsense to get around it. They were still doing it. Now, my favorite thing about this story is not that this, you know, government study blah blah blah. Why did this why why did this come about? This came about because the FTC was earnestly trying to do what a Jeep Pie told them they were, were responsible for and they didn't know. That was the climate that we were in with the Jeep. He's like, no, no, this is an FTC thing. And the FTC's like, wait, we thought you guys were doing this. Oh, okay, we'll give it the old college try. This is a result from them just trying in earnest to look at the industry to see if it needs regulation. <laughs> they opened it up, and it was like just the most horrifying thing you could possibly imagine. And they quickly closed it. But I, I doubt that the specific series of events that has to happen for this to happen would. But if by some miracle, Rosenworcel gets confirmed before the end of the year and the FTC kicks this back up, it'll be like a wheel kick into the goal. She'll, she'll be like, she'll do a full 360 and then she'll pull her shirt off like, uh, like that one Olympics girl and run around in her sports bra to dunk on this because that, this is just so obvious. She's taking her shirt and like whipping other regulators. Yeah, yeah and it's just, why, why did you need three bozos, uh, you know, at a table to tell you that this was happening and it, no one else is reporting on this or saying well, anything I, about it? Yeah, I said, we're well, reading a report from someone else. Yeah, but I mean, we were saying this on like day one of Ajit Pai's inauguration. Like, this is the plan, guys. You got to look back at that again, and I'll say it. Ajit Pai was the hardest working man in corruption. <laughs> look what he got done. He did accomplish a lot yeah. in a very short amount of time. <laughs> That's incredible. For the top eight or so ISPs. When it comes to government accomplishments in short periods of time, Ajit Pai has got to be near the top. <laughs> They're not good accomplishments, no, but, no. but wonder, they did accomplish stuff. I wonder if in his mind he's like, look, I created a whole new market. That's a whole new revenue stream for ISPs. And it's just like... Mm. Often, I spend way too much time thinking about that. I, I spent my time thinking, is it the... Are you just greedy or do you believe some of this stuff? And I think if they believe it, it's so much more dangerous. That's what I was saying <laughs> yeah. in that one episode, like Monday, I guess. Because it's like, if they really believe this... There is no hope, and the aliens need to come and just sterilize. There's a more do-it-yourself way we could deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> and YouTube, if that was in the first 10 minutes, YouTube's like, oh, don't show that to anybody. <laughs> I'm talking about discourse, of course. Right. Yes. And not the forum <laughs> software. <laughs> Krista, I cut off two of your buys last week because when Wendell did it and I cut it off in the middle, it was hilarious. But when you do it, it's not as hilarious and people were angry. Really? So please give us a prolonged goodbye. Bye. Bye.